All right, well, we are going live here. Hello, everybody. This is sort of our pre-show. Uh, we will get started here in just a second. We're double checking emails, making sure everyone's gotten invited. Right, Sierra? Yes, I just had a few people that said they didn't get the email. Um, okay. So I'm just responding to them. Yep, and I'm checking too. And um, I know I kind of want to say, all right, if you didn't get it, go check your spam. But yeah, I think those but people couldn't see this, so they wouldn't no. know. <laughs> But I had a couple people message me on Facebook too, so that's fine. Okay, well, we'll take care of all those things, and then welcome to those of you that are watching, and we will we will get started here in a in a minute. All right. Um. Let's see. We're still doing pre-show stuff here. I'm looking. Uh, I think we're good. Most everybody seems to have gotten the email. So I think. Oh, um, let's see. Okay. So, um, all right. So we're. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay. People are we're starting just, to come in. Yes. People, I see some people starting to come in now. Hello to those of you. We're doing our little pre-show. We're getting ready to get started here in just a second, but we wanted to um, just kind of give everyone a chance to come in, make sure our mic is working, all that jazz, right, Sarah? <laughs> I think I think we're good. Yes, making sure my earbuds are not going to fly out. I know that happens, doesn't it? Yes. If I yeah. take if I move one foot away from this desk, I'm going to recreate that scene from my big fat Greek wedding where she like gets yanked back. <laughs> And did you see they're making a new a sequel to that? I'm so excited about that. I love I, I really love that movie. <laughs> I love it. There's one scene from that that I love about where like, what was it like the woman turns the head of the man or something I can't remember. I gotta go back and watch it. Yeah. It's on my list. I wanna watch that. So <laughs> it is a family favorite of ours. It is. No um, idea we would be talking about that during our pre-show. Okay. So. I know. Yeah. Who would have thought? <laughs> well, um, it's, I've got that it's just after 11. If you're ready, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Well, it's just after noon on my end. But oh, that's yeah. right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Central time. I'm in te I gave away my location. I'm in Texas. Yeah, everybody is um, in different locations, but it's, yeah. it's about time for us to start, I guess I, we could say. I think so. Let me double check. I'm just going to double check the my email real quick and make sure that nobody else okay. has um, contacted me. But I think that we are good and you know what I'll check I'll double check too and make sure that because we want everyone to get in have fun with us yeah because we got a lot of stuff to do today I know um yeah I have not gotten any any more notes than what I got this morning so um people asking so I I think we're we're good on my end if um if you think that we're good on yours I think so I just messaged one more link out and we are good and if if I get quiet at any point, it's because somebody else <laughs> is okay. trying to join in. That's fine. That's fine. Teachers will be forgiving. <laughs> Hopefully, right? All yes. right. Well, we are so glad everyone's with us. Um, so should we get started then? Are you ready, Sarah? I am ready. Let's do this. All right. Okay. Well, everyone, yes, we're finishing up the pre-show and actually starting it. And hi, I'm Tracy Selly. I'm the author of 101 Piano Practice Tips, and I'm also a piano teacher. I am a wife, and I'm mom, and I'm the creator of the Upbeat Piano Teacher Webinars. And I'm so excited because I'm about to release a new one called Group Lessons 101, and I wanted to do something different this time. As most of you know, I wanted to have a co-host, and yes, it's Sarah Campbell. And I decided to invite Sarah because last summer on the Facebook group, she just posted so many fun group lesson pictures. And I thought, oh, she would just be a great asset. And so many of you know Sarah, but she is a piano and voice teacher from Pennsylvania. She's been teaching for 10 years. She's had her own studio for about five years. It's a smashing success. Uh, Sarah has her bachelor degree in music performance and a master's of music in musicology. She is an active lecturer and an active blogger. And I think she has always got a project going on. So Sarah, I'm glad that you made time for this. <laughs> I am too, Tracy, because this has been a lot of fun. Um, you and I have been so busy finalizing Group Lessons 101, um, and today we're very excited to present 
to all of you some nice free advice. And hopefully this advice is gonna be something that will really help you out this summer and even in the spring as you do some group lessons. So we've talked to some amazing experts over the past month and a half. And Tracy and I have learned so much. So we are gonna share five tips that hopefully will help you maximize your success with groups and camps. Because let's face it, um, when we're used to teaching one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes teaching groups can be a little bit scary, right, Tracy? Yes, Sarah, you know me too well, right? I, I wrote in the, um, this month in the Piano Bench Mag, I wrote about my, um, sometimes I just get, it's not intimidated with group lessons, but I tend to gravitate to more private lessons, kind of that one-on-one. -on -one. And I, you know, I joke that there's a reason that God made me an only child and I have an only child and I just don't really, oh, we got a sneak peek there of, of Sarah's that graphic. Okay. I got the camera back. Um, but I, I just, I just prefer the one-on-one -on -one, I think. And this morning I was thinking back going, why is that? And Sarah, I had this funny memory where I was thinking about my friends growing up. My best friends were sisters and they fought a lot. And so many times our moms would pile us in the back seat, and I'd have Lisa on one side and I'd have Maria on the other and they would fight over top of me because they argued all the time. And so I think it goes back to them. So I need to send them a note and say, you've turned me off of group lessons. <laughs> but the truth is there are a lot of benefits and I have done group lessons. There are a lot of benefits. And so I think, you know, for teachers who maybe are like me and you do uh, tend to gravitate toward the private, you just need to remember that you want your students to be well-rounded. Sometimes we have to step outside of our box to give them what they really need. So hopefully today, um, teachers are going to find a lot of these tips that we have very helpful. Maybe all of them will apply to you. And if not, hopefully at least one or two you can take in and put to use. Right, Sarah? Absolutely. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, you know, sometimes teachers are a little leery about articles that deal with income. So when I first came up with this title, I thought, mm, I hope nobody's going to, you know, shy away from this. Uh, you know, we love our students. And yes, we're musicians and we're artists and art is for everyone. But as teachers, we deserve to get paid for our hard work. And so I'm excited that you all joined us today because I think it's really important that we learn to value ourselves as business owners. So let's get started with tip number one. Absolutely, yes, and you're right. We do need to realize that we are business owners. Um, I love this, this tip number one is to keep it fun. Um, and that's something I have to remember. Just let the kids have a good time. That's what's important. And um, let me tell you a little bit about these pictures. The top left is from Candace Crabtree. Now she's one of our featured guests in this webinar. And this is from her Christmas group lesson. You can see all those kids are having a blast, a little snack break there. The top right, Sarah, this is one that you gave us from your music Olympics camp. And of yes. course, this is a nice outside when kids are having a blast outside. They and then are. The yeah, they are. The bottom one is from Cheryl Wells. She's another guest that we're going to have um, on this webinar. And this is from her camp, or at least this part of it is called Big Musical Dice. Oh my gosh, I love these dice. Um, give me two seconds. I just have another person who messaged me and said they didn't get the link. So oh, I'm that's fine. That's fine. pasting and come on and join us, Amy. I hope you get here soon. Okay, so. Um, I love the idea of making things larger than life. So sometimes bringing the fun and keeping the fun can be as simple as just making something really big. And I actually wrote about this on my blog last year when I blew up an eight by 11 inch map into a three foot by five foot map. And my kids used it during their composition workshop and they absolutely loved it. And what Cheryl did here with these dice, super fun. I did something similar with um, 12 by 12 boxes and I put letters on them. You probably all saw them um, in uh, preview pictures for group lessons 101. And it's just, it's a simple thing and kids absolutely love it. So keeping it fun is all about keeping balance in your group lessons and in your camps. Sure, your main goal is education, but I've actually found that the most successful and memorable experiences my kids have are also really well balanced with activities that encourage two other things, communication skills and creativity. And okay, so can you give us an example of an experience like that? Like like the fun, you've got 34% there. <laughs> We want specifics. Okay. Well, first off, I have to say it was funny as I was creating this 
graph, you know, I was trying to think, okay, I'm going to make them in equal thirds. Um, and of course, you know, math, <laughs> that, right. that last percent. And I love that the the graph decided that that last percent had to go in fun and creative. That wasn't oh, me. Well, there you go. <laughs> So um, things that are fun and creative. One of the things that I did during my Music Blast camp last year um, was to allow the kids to explore. So I had two stations where I had the kids exploring to see why does this work this way? And I gave them very little direction. I just said, you know, I really like you to explain this to me. And they all worked together for 20 minutes trying to figure things out. Um, and they came up with solutions. They came up with answers. Um, one of the stations that I had them do was where I gave them access to everything that I had in the camp, all of the instruments, all of the rhythm cards, all of the, um, you know, balls and bats and all these things. And I said, okay, split off into teams. You have 30 minutes. I would like you to design me a music game. It has to have a specific focus that you are teaching, but it has to be really, really fun. And then you're going to show me how to play that game. That is an excellent idea. I love it. You're kind of putting them in charge for a little bit and forcing, well, not forcing. You can't force creativity, <laughs> can you? I love that though, but you are giving them a little a little bit of control um, and letting exactly. them create their own thing. I think that's a exactly. great idea. And I actually had videos. Um, I, I videoed the kids when they were done creating the games um, so that I could kind of get an idea of what was going on. And I, and I think, I'm so glad I videoed them, uh, them explaining the rules because I'm actually going to use a couple of those games in, in one of my camps this summer. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Oh. All right. Well, yeah, let's, um, if, do you have anything else to add about the tip number one? This, or are we going to go on to, well, we have, well, the, um, oh yeah, this poster, we wanted to talk about this. Um, I love this poster because I love how, I love all of the, like if you look at the little banner in the left-hand side, the limited to 10 students. Um, I love that it's exciting. Um, I love that, like look in the le the bottom left-hand corner, you've got the suggested ages. Of course, you've got the, the camp tuition, you've got the price, but you're hitting on all the big things and yet it still has this fun look. Any kid who saw this would want to go to Camp Sarah. <laughs> well, that was the idea behind making this poster. I wanted something that was extremely eye-catching um, and had a lot going on. It also had all the information that parents were looking for. Um, and I want to make a note here. Um, those of you who are watching right now, you're going to note that my camp tuition was only $80. That does not necessarily have to be your tuition. This is, you know, for my specific area, I live in a very rural place, farms all around. So this tuition is actually really competitive. You need to, you know, keep in mind that your place, your area will be different. And that's actually something we talk about in the webinar about how to price camps and how to advertise them. We do, because it, it does depend on, on exactly where where you live and um, and what's going on at the time. And, and we do talk about some strategies with that. So, you know, tip number one, just in a, in a nutshell, keep it fun. Kids are going to sign up for your camp if you have something that it, it just looks really awesome. Um, if it's not something that, that looks fun, they're probably not going to sign up. And, you know, just because it's fun, just because it's fun doesn't mean that it can't be educational, too. All right. Yeah, you're right. All right. Are we moving on to our next slide? Oh, there we have our next one, the engaging in the now. I love these graphics here. These pictures are fantastic. Okay, so we've got one here from Movie Magic Camp. It's about John Williams, which is a fusion camp, acting, video, composition. And we talk about um, Sarah's idea of a fusion camp in the webinar. So um, I don't know if you want to fill people in on that in just a minute, Sarah, or um, we yeah, I'll talk about that in just a minute. In. Yeah. Okay. And then in the top right, we have um, a picture from the Hogwarts Music Camp. Now this, oh, now make sure I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, Sarah. Carol? Ivkovich. Ivkovich. That's it. Iv. Ivkovich. Yes. <laughs> she talks about her Hogwarts Music Camp. And actually, we've got a really good coupon for that, too, for people that might want to get that. And then that bottom picture is from Marie Lee, her amazing Halloween party. She oh. has some really good ideas with, yeah. This, I heard you. 
this was just an amazing idea. When Marie told us about this, this comes from Marie Lee. She actually uses a Halloween party every year as an experience where students can engage like in the holiday activities. You know, they come dressed up in their Halloween costumes. She has it at her house and she sets up her one of her um, keyboards outside. She has it amplified and she actually has the kids playing over a two hour period to everybody who's walking around the neighborhood. So this this is like the best kind of guerrilla advertising that I've ever heard about. And it's also like a wonderful opportunity for, you know, students to just have fun and come in in their costume and they're also getting performance. So yeah, yay. it's brilliant. It really, really is. I mean, you've already got people coming to your door, <laughs> right? It's yeah. Halloween exactly. and they're kids. They're not like adults. They're well, I mean, they're, you know, some adults bring them, <laughs> but it is your target market coming to your house why not put on a little performance and have fun? It kind of gets back to what you've said, right? Keep it fun. I love that, Keep Sarah. Fun. And engage in the season. So here's what I mean by engaging now. Um, look at all these things that we have going on here. Um, you really need to talk about what students are doing at that moment. So Tracy, what are your kids into nowadays? Okay, you know, I was actually thinking about this and it, it was Star Wars. Now, right now, Star Wars has died down just a little bit, but everyone is still talking about Star Wars. And I think sometimes, at least for my, my kids right now, I don't know, maybe it's kind of a lull in what's going on, but they just want fun. They want something fun. They're not into the lesson books as much right now. They want something that's a little bit different and kind of out of the box. So I'm having to step out of my beautiful box, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Good, Tracy, I love it. <laughs> my kids, um, last year I noticed in the waiting room, I had a lot of students who always brought in books. And so I was, you know, kind of sneaking a peek at, well, what are they reading this week? And I'd, I'd ask them, you know, hey, what are you reading? What's that about? And I noticed that I had a lot of kids who were really into like fantasy style, um, you know, dragons and fairies um, or like Harry Potter and magic and the Hunger Games and all mm -hmm. of these things. And so I thought, you know, all right, I wanna teach my kids how to compose, but how can I package that in a way that's gonna be very engaging for them and is gonna make them go, yeah, you know, that sounds interesting because it's something that I like. Um, so I created this composition workshop Shop where um, they got to read and write um, and draw and do all these kinds of things in addition to composing. You know, and you saying that makes me think, um, and this is sort of what happened to me just this past week. I have a student who loved, um, I don't know if you saw the movie, The Giver. It I came out. I've seen that. Oh, Sarah, you should get, you should see it. The book was good. It was a little odd, but good. But the movie was really, really good. It, it was one of those that you talk about afterwards and you really think. But anyway, I digress. In there, there was a beautiful piano piece called Rosemary's Piano Theme. And one of my students just recently saw the movie and she was determined that she wanted to play that. And, you know, it's kind of exactly what you say there. You've got to know your audience, but we found that for her and she's played it and she loves it. And if you can meet your students in their world, you're going to be much more successful. I love that phrase, meet your students in their world. Um, and you know, you brought up the idea of movie music. It doesn't have to necessarily be um, movies. You know, you can engage kids in sports. You can have sports themes. Um, you can think of, you know, be creative. There are all kinds of things that kids are into now, but pop music is like, the number one for my studio this yes. year. My, I have a lot of teens and tweens, actually mostly tweens, or what are the, <laughs> the pre-tweens? I don't know. They're, they're, they're <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I did in the fall is that I decided when I had group lessons that for my older students, I was going to teach them how to play pop music. And mm -hmm. I have three, um, uh, I have a grand piano, an acoustic um, upright, and I have a keyboard. So I actually have three keyboards where people can play. And so I split the kids off onto those, you know, doubling them up, two on a bench. Mm -hmm. And we all played um, songs by the Beatles. Now, I know that's like not pop music right now, but they knew the music and they were excited to play it. Next year, I'm gonna try some other pop music too. Oh, I think that's a great idea. And they do know it. They know the music. They've heard those songs. And, and it was fun. And it was really fun to do, and, and bonus here, I had a lot of groups to teach that week. Four of those groups were for older kids. I had one lesson plan, four groups. 
boom, done. See, now that's awesome. You know, I remember when I, um, I'm digressing just a tiny bit, but in the last webinar, I remember it was Andrea Bentz talking about preschoolers and she teaches preschoolers groups. And she said that was one of the nice things is that you do, you have one plan, but multiple groups. And that kind of gets back, Sarah, to what you were saying about your income. I mean, if, if you're really looking to increase your income as many of us, many of us want to, then that's a great way. So, okay. It really is. Moving on, yes. So I just wanted to show this slide here. Um, during this improv workshop that I did two years ago, I actually had students bring in um, several of their favorite pop tunes and we worked on lead sheet reading, um, which is a skill that I, I really love to teach my students because I think it's something that they're going to use for the rest of their life. They um, will, they will. I agree because I am um, for much of my career so far. I've been a church pianist. I'm not a church pianist right now, but so many of the worship services are going contemporary and they're all lead sheets. And if you don't know how to play that, if you can only play out of a hymn book, you're going to be in trouble. Lots, yeah. lots of them use it. And, and we need to equip our students. So one of the things we did in that workshop, like some people get a little intimidated, teachers, I should say, get intimidated um, when teaching pop because some of these pop songs are like 12 pages long. Um, you don't have to do that. Just focus on the hook. Um, as Jennifer Eklund would say, the hook is like the best yep. part of the song, that the part that you want to learn. And what I did is I took that hook of each song that they brought in and I said, okay, let's analyze the chords. We looked at the chords and then we turned them into improv um, improvisation exercises. So we had fun plus education, and we were also engaging in the now because we were doing something that they wanted to play. And it wasn't overwhelming because you were focusing on the hook, as you say. Exactly. It's just the easy part of the song. I love that. All right. Here we go. <laughs> okay, well, um, teach more for less. All right, let's talk about these pictures real quick. In the top left there, that is from Carol... Ivkovich. Did I say it right this time? You did. Yay. She is the sweetest thing. I'm she so is. sorry. It's kind of like my last name, Sally. Everyone pronounces it wrong. But anyway, this is Swatter Rhythm Note Game. Um, of course, this is from a group lesson. And of course, Sarah, the um, the picture there in the upper right hand corner is one of your group classes. And you're talking about good practice tips. And I think somewhere in there, there's a therapy cat. You, you know, know, you can't yeah. see him in this. And I'll maybe I'll post a picture of him on my blog. We know you'd love this. Cats. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then Marie Lee, uh, she has given us this this bottom picture here. It's from one of her group piano classes, and um, it's really interesting. She has come up with a great way to have group lessons. She rents a space from a, I think it's a Yamaha, isn't it a Yamaha music store? I think it is, Sarah. I but believe she, so. Yeah, she talks about that in her webinar, but how she's transitioned from her home to another location, and she thought about building her own location, and she's renting space instead, and she has really come up with a very successful and thriving business. She she fills you in on all the details on that in the webinar. But um, anyway, the, the idea here is just you are teaching more kids, it's less time, and you're getting more money. Exactly. Um, one of the things that um, Marie Lee taught me, which I just, I. I think I knew this before, but the way she worded it just made so much sense to me. Um, why teach one concept five different times when you can teach that same concept one time and make five times the money if you're teaching a group class? It just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So one of the things, um, you know, if you're interested in finding the space to teach an occasional group lesson to your private students, or if you're considering opening a student a studio like Marie with multiple keyboards, everybody has to start somewhere. And I think a lot of times we get very intimidated with the idea of expanding. It can be very scary. The picture that you just saw of Marie Lee's studio, that didn't happen overnight. Not at all. She worked very hard for that. She went through multiple stages, just like you have on there. There's transition phases. And she actually talks a little bit about that. Um, but Sarah, you have to share the story about Marie, where she talked about when she was in her home and the the oh, different yes. instruments that she had. <laughs> well, I love this because she has inspired me and I am bound and determined to actually start a, a weekly group class in the fall because um, she said, you know, she started out teaching in her home and she had a piano 
you know, an acoustic piano. She had mm -hmm. an organ that she had inherited from somebody, I believe. Um, and she had like a, a, a little tiny keyboard. Uh, so she had these three very different instruments, but she taught group lessons on those three instruments and the kids absolutely loved it. She allowed the kids to rotate each week to play a different instrument. And um, which one was the one they were always fighting over, Tracy? The organ. <laughs> Isn't that funny? She was so surprised. You'd think yeah. you would not want that one, but that was the one they ended up kind of fighting over. It was yeah. a great story. And, and I love that because she was making it work. So many times I think we think for group lessons, oh, you have to have multiple keyboards. You have to have this. You have to have that. No, you don't. It's exactly what you have here on this graphic. There, You can transition where you are now. Start where you are, transition, but do you see where you want to be? Have a vision, right? Exactly, have a vision. And you know, um, there are all kinds of different possibilities to te teach group lessons without multiple keyboards. We talk a lot about that in the webinar. Um, you just have to make a plan. You have to have a vision and know where you're going to get and know how to get where you're going. You know, three years ago, um, I opened my studio five years ago and I had, I'm not in, I wasn't in the room that I'm in now. Um, I, I started in a much smaller room and I had, um, my upright piano and then, you know, I, I was given a baby grand. And so I crammed that in there and I had like no room at all to move. And so three years ago I said, you know what, I opened this space, but I need more. So I spent an entire summer cleaning and painting and moving things out of this room that was next door and then it happened. So I opened up this new space that was like twice the size of what, almost triple the size of what I had before. And then a year later, um, I finally took out my first business loan and I got that grand piano that I've always dreamed about. I love that. I'm a little envious of you for that, Sarah. <laughs> well, I'm don't be too envious, I'll be paying for years. <laughs> I'm happy for you, but I love it. You had a plan and a vision and, and you went for it. And, exactly. um, and I love it. And it's so encouraging for teachers to see success stories from ordinary teachers, right? These are just ordinary teachers. And, and here, let's, let's talk a little bit more about Marie. She's one of our guests that's going to be on here, but, um, Marie, she's going to be sharing a, a super helpful step-by-step -step guide. It details um, how she set up group lessons in her new studio and she kind of goes over all of this in her interview presentation but she also gave us the PDF that we can share with um, everyone who who gets that webinar and it will be available in the group lessons 101 uh, she just has so much information and and hearing from someone who has been there and done that just kind of makes your path a little bit easier doesn't it Sarah it really really does so our um, last tip here, um, oh, we're already on tip number five, wow. <laughs> uh, but we've got more to do after that. Um, our last tip here um, is about tapping into new audiences. Um, so on the top left and the bottom two pictures here, this actually comes from Susan Chesser. Um, and uh, Susan, I just got, uh, Ryan Chesser just came up with a piece uh, last night, actually. I love this. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> and I played it before I came on to the webinar. I needed to relax a little bit and I played it. It was beautiful. Yes. So um, uh, Susan is one of our upbeat piano teacher is, and she had a group class for younger students. And I just love these pictures. They're working with Play-Doh and making notes. That looks like so much fun. Definitely something you could do in a home school class. Mm -hmm. um, and on the top right, um, here's something that I haven't tapped into yet. And I don't think Tracy, you've done this either, but what a great idea to start a beginning piano class for adults or even retirees. Oh, yes, yes, that is a good idea. And why not, right? Thinking, at, it's that thinking outside the box, thinking of, um, um, yes, you know, sometimes I don't, I don't like that box, but. <laughs> The box makes us, a, stepping out of the box makes a bigger teacher. Sometimes I laugh. I say, my box is decorated so beautifully. I like my <laughs> box, but we have to step out. I think you're getting a lot better at stepping out of your box, Tracy. I'm I impressed. am. I am. I'm, I'm stretching. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of um, the scheduling box, you know, we all have our schedules. Um, you know, I bet most of our schedules are pretty similar. Um, some people work in the in the daytime, um, but for those of us who don't have like a, a, a nine to five job where we just start teaching in the afternoon, our scheduling hours are really limited because we have to wait for kids to get out of school. And then, you know, 
you can only teach so many hours in a row before you're exhausted. Um, so you have to think about maybe stepping outside of that schedule box and looking for opportunities where you could do a group class. Maybe doing it a little bit earlier in the day for like a homeschool group and then giving yourself a break and then you can come back and teach later. And it's not like you're gonna have to do this every day. It's a group class. You're doing it one day a week. So you're teaching like four or five students. I mean, depending on the group versus private rate that you figured out, you've tripled or quadrupled your income possibility in a really short amount of time. Yeah, I love that. And you know what? Um, this thinking outside your schedule box, um, Sarah, I'm going to go ahead and bring this back to me because we're on this last graphic there, right? Oh, uh, not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay. I'm sorry. Here's, here's I'm sorry. our, um, yeah, there you go. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So there you're talking about the, the piano classes, um, but you're talking about stepping outside the box. And so I was just going to say, you know, when we moved last year, it forced me to step outside the box um, with Skype lessons and also with, um, there we go. And also um, with regard to, yeah, just growing my studio. And one thing that I did um, was, of course, I reached out to homeschoolers. Personally, we've done a little homeschool, a little private school. And if you're looking for some homeschoolers, here are some tips that have worked for me. Um, when I was uh, in Arlington, about a little more than half of my studio was homeschoolers. And here I have, I have to run through and count almost half is homeschoolers. And I think part of that is because we ourselves have done that. But if you can find one homeschool family, that helps because they will tell their friends. Um, so that is that is key. There are some homeschool groups that you can get in on Facebook, but sometimes they are particular about who gets into the group. But if your homeschooling family is in there, and, and again, they can get in there and post that you have openings, that helps. Also some churches, a lot of churches have homeschool groups. So you know, if you go to a church, you might wanna ask around who are the homeschoolers. That would be just another way that you could connect with someone in the homeschooling community. Some cities have homeschool conventions. Maybe you could go there and do something and reach out to some people there. And another thing, I never researched this, Sarah. I don't know what your schools are like there, but um, where we are now, there is a private school that has what they call an arts block. This is just brilliant. I wish every, I know all what the teachers. Arts block? Okay. All, all the teachers are going to say, I wish everyone did this. They have an arts block. And so what you can do is during that time, you can choose what type of artsy elective you want to take. You can go take the traditional music class or you can have a private piano class or a private violin class. And I have a lot of private students at this school during the day, but they're not homeschoolers. They're, they're just there. So now the parents don't have to bring the kids to me in the afternoon. They're doing that during school. It's just great. I love it. Well, that's fabulous. That's yeah. a great way to tap in. I know, you know, and I'm glad that you explained how to get um, into the homeschool groups because I think that's, uh, it's different in every area. And I've seen that question pop up a ton in piano teacher forums. You know, how do I get a hold of these homeschoolers? Um, so, you know, like you said, if you have one homeschool student, that is, that is kind of your in. And um, I have that in my studio. I have three siblings that come in, they're homeschooled. Um, and I also have a number of uh, kids who are cyber schooled now. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you know, and they can come in before the three o'clock time. So there you go. <laughs> hey, Sarah, I, I made a note here. I've, I've got to share one personal story. Okay. I didn't okay. intend to do it, but it follows up on one of the tips that you talked about, about connecting with our students. So you mentioned Susan Chesser and her husband, Ryan, and he just came out with this song. It's, um, let's see, Jennifer Eklund. It's on Piano Pronto and her what is it, Composer's Community? I think yes. that's what it's called. Okay, so he just came out with this song, Shadows by Moonlight, yesterday, and I love it. Okay, so I, of course, I had a student that canceled, and I thought, hmm, let me go buy that piece. So I bought it, and I was playing it. And my son, who was 15, he stopped playing the piano about a year ago. That's a whole other story. I wanted him to... <laughs> Well, I wanted him to stop while he still had a love for it. I knew he would come back. If it was drudgery... I just knew I wasn't going to win. So as much as it, you know, it pained me, I, I said, okay, you can, you can take a break. Well, anyway, yesterday as I was playing a uh, Ryan song, Matthew walked in the room and said, I want to learn that. That is fabulous. Okay. So it gets even better. All right. I know we're digressing, but teachers will care. So then I sent a note to Susan and Ryan and told them that, and he said that he 
uh, when he was 14 or 15, he heard his mom playing a song on the piano and he walked in the room and said, I want to learn that. How cool is that? That is, oh, wow, I love that little connection. I know, That's just fabulous. sort of passing it on. But I think that the, the point of that and how I, I, I kind of really can relate this back to the tips, I promise I can, it's that <laughs> stepping into his world. That song, it it stepped into Matthew's world. And so now I think I'm going to be able to, to get him back into playing piano. But otherwise, you know, that would have been lost. That's true. <laughs> and, and, and you just have to, you have to come to their, you have to come to where they are. So I hope um, that everybody found those tips helpful. You know, just keep, keep it fun, engage in the now, uh, teach more for less, tap into those non-prime time hours. Um, and I think it's going to be awesome. So I think it is. There are so many great tips here. And I think that teachers can only benefit by trying this. I remember, oh gosh, which interview was it? Was it Candace Crabtree? I think she said, what have you got to lose? 45 minutes. You know, I just realized I, um, I was minus one tip here, um, and I skipped over it. So I'm going to just go over it real quickly here. Do you want to pop it up? No, that's okay. I'm just going okay. to talk about it. Um, so this is tip number five, um, and you need to stop letting your waiting list wait around. I don't know if you guys are anything like me. I have a waiting list that's about 10 students deep right now. Um, and I, I have a lot of them, you know, that keep asking me, you know, are there spots open? And I, I'm 100% full. I can't fit anybody in right now. So I started thinking about this. If you're carrying a waiting list all the time, you know, by the time you get to that waiting list, some of these students have been on there for six months. Maybe they found another teacher or something, you know, and, and you've lost that opportunity. Meanwhile, that student had initially reached out to you and wanted to study with you. So here's the idea. Don't let them wait around on that waiting list. This can work for the fall schedule. So if you have a waiting list that's like there in the summertime or even in the spring, and you have a whole bunch of beginner students, this is what you need to do. Do a beginner group class. Even if you can't fit them in as private students, do a beginner group class. And then as private lesson spots open up, you already have those students under your schedule. They've already been working with you and they will gladly fill those spots or they just might be addicted to group lessons. So. <laughs> That is a brilliant idea though. That's just brilliant because you already have them in your studio. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And what a nice simple way to start too. You know, for teachers who are new to group lessons, hey, we're gonna start with just this one. I think that's excellent. And you're right, Why take? you should take advantage of your waiting list. Don't let it sit around. And even if it's just two or three students, if you have a group lesson with them for a few months, you're, you're making, you know, double or triple your income and you're not losing them off of your waiting list. So when you do have that spot open up, they are ready and they're gonna go right in there. I think that's an excellent idea. I'm so glad that you remember that we didn't cover that. We have so much we're trying to cover here, Sarah, <laughs> in a limited time, because we know teachers are busy. Yes. All right, we do have some teacher questions that we're gonna go over. Are we ready to dive into those? Let's do the Q and A. Yes. Okay, so teachers wrote in with a couple of questions, and I'm not gonna read the whole entire question, I'll just try to skim over it, but um, this first one is from Julie. She is a traveling teacher, and so she, her piano families are used to her going to their homes. She would like to do a camp, or a group lesson at her home, but she doesn't know if these families will actually travel to her home because they're so used to having the lessons at their home. And also mm. she doesn't want to go through the hassle of planning if there's not a lot of interest. And so she's wondering, should she survey her families, find out if they're interested? I don't know. I know that you have been sort of in a similar situation, Sarah. Do you have tips for her? Um, I do. Okay, so this is kind of like a twofold question. The first it is, is yeah. are people going to come to a different location when I normally come to their home? Well, okay. Um, yes, I think they will, personally. Uh, I don't actually, I mean, I have a big space behind me here, but I don't teach my summer camps here. I teach them at different locations. Um, I teach them at a local university, and I also teach them um, on my farm so we can do outdoor activities. Um, and people come. You know, they come because, but here's the reason why they go. They go because I'm offering really fun and engaging topics. So if you're going to um, survey your parents, uh, don't, don't come up with like a, a really kind of general survey. You need a survey that's very specific about what you're going to offer and um, make it sound ex super exciting. And that's how you're going to hook people in. 
Okay, excellent. I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think that that's great. Um, okay, we're going to move on to the next one here. Okay, I have, um, so this question here, um, do teachers take a break from teaching private lessons during the weeks when they run a camp, or do they just schedule camps at a time of day when they don't have private lesson students? Yes, and Corinne a answered this, um, or she asked this question. Do you have yeah. thoughts on that? And then... Um, I do, yeah, and, and and then maybe you can chime in here. Um, I actually change my scheduling when I do camp weeks. Um, I use an online scheduling program, um, and I talk about this a lot in the Upbeat Piano Teachers private uh, forum that we have. Um, but I use an online scheduling program so that students and parents can schedule their, their own lessons. And during the weeks when I'm teaching camps, I make my availability very, very small. So when I'm teaching camp in the morning, I'm teaching for a couple of hours. Um, actually, one of my most of my camps are two hours long, but one of my camps is five hours long. <laughs> that's a long <laughs> camp. It is a really long camp. That's a voice and movement class, though, so that's a whole different animal. Um, and I, I take, you know, I do that in the morning and then I take a nice big break because I need to, you know, just sit and be quiet for a moment and um, get my lunch and then think about what I'm teaching that afternoon, maybe plan for the next, um, you know, day of camp. Um, and then I only teach maybe two or three hours in the afternoon while I'm teaching camps. And I've actually considered for like the longer workshop, I don't think I'm going to teach it all that week. Okay, and I'm thinking too um, with regard to this question because I'm not teaching group lessons, so I I'm not I have done it in the past, but right now I'm not, so I, I'm not great to answer this question right now. But I will say that um, Candace Crabtree, she's got a she's in our webinar group as one of our featured guests, and she has come up with a really unique way of offering private lessons. And then the last week of the month, she cancels the private lessons or doesn't hold the private lessons and has a group lesson instead. So she's kind of found a way that makes both work for her and her family. And I think there's another guest that does that too. Each of the guests kind of have their own spin on it and they found a unique way to make that work. Exactly. Um, oh, you have another question here. I do. We still have a couple more we're going to get okay. to here. Okay. So this next one is from Morgan. And she said, now I will tell you, our, our webinar does address this because this is a big concern for a lot of teachers, is figuring out who to group together. Do you do it by age? Do you do it by level? Sometimes I have a teenager who's brand new to piano. Um, another thing that she struggles with is knowing if something is too childish for older students. And I know this is something that we cover in the webinar, but we should probably go ahead and talk about it a little bit right now, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, we actually talked about this with quite a few of our guests, I think. Um, we did. I think this yeah. is a big question for a lot of teachers. It is. I think teachers get nervous because when you have a group that has a lot of different ages in it and different levels in it, you're not sure what to do. Um, right. So there is a balance that you have to create. Um, and sometimes it is best to group ages and abilities that are pretty close. Um, but you're still going to have a range inside of that. And, and when you do find that there's a little bit of an unbalanced um, thing going on, um, the older students who are a little bit more advanced, that is when they can step into helper roles. And they start to become little mini teachers. And, and it's so wonderful to watch them do this because there is no better way to learn than to be able to teach something to somebody else. And so when you have maybe younger kids who might be struggling with a concept, you, you pull aside your older students and you say, can you help her? And it's, it's like a whole new learning experience for them because not only they're, they're learning how to teach something to somebody, they're also learning how to communicate with somebody, which is communication skills are just huge. And I think kids don't get them in schools enough nowadays. Um, so I think that's one way to really make it work. I think so. And I know when I had the group lessons that that's what I did too. And um, yeah, there are so many values that you can get teaching those teenagers. And um, yeah, you hit it, Sarah. I agree. All right. You have another question for us. Yes. Um, a few more. Okay. There's there there's like this is like a two part question. It says, do you have some sort of contract for parents to sign, or a medical permission in case a child has an accident? And that is a really good question. Uh, Tracy, do you want to talk a little bit about what our guest experts said about that? Yeah. Well. Um yeah, see, this is the part that I, this is the part that makes me nervous. So I, I like that we address this a little bit. I think it was um, Cheryl Wells probably hit on this more than, than anyone because she has done some very large camps. I think she, I want to say there were like 25 and 30 students in her camps. Um, yes. And she, yes, yeah, she does have a, I think it was a, a safety, um, she has a safety form that she actually gave us. So all of our, our, 
teachers will, will get access to that. But um, there are medical permission forms that she has them to fill out. And, um, and I think she's checked, yeah. Is that all I was gonna say about that? Sarah? Yeah, there's, a, <laughs> there's a medical That's permission so form and um, the contract for parents to sign. Um, it's, it's not a contract like, uh, like you would think it's a it's a photo release form actually and that's something that I use as well I have a photo and video release form that I have all parents sign at the beginning um, and we do talk about in a couple of our interviews uh, we talk about different options for you know making sure that when people sign up they don't back out at the last minute and then you're minus all these kids that you needed for your camp and now you're my, you know you bought all the materials and now you're minus a, a bunch of money um, so we talk about that as well yes and I'm so glad that you brought up about the photo release we have both of those forms that are included yeah, yeah. when I I've yeah, I have a lot, million notes here, so I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Okay, well, um, I think our last question here is, let me see here. Okay, this one, oh, this was from Christina. I know this was from Christina. Okay, this is kind of a scheduling question, and I think that this might actually affect a lot of teachers. She basically has a full-time job that is year round and she wants to try some camps but she doesn't know when to do it she doesn't really want to use her vacation week to do it she said last year she thought about a camp each thursday night during during july um there was one older oh but there was one older student she didn't know how it would work with younger students okay well we already hit on that but basically it's a scheduling issue how would you schedule a camp around a full-time job and i know you had a few thoughts on that sarah you know that is so, so what time did you say she was done with work is it like a five o'clock i thing think it's or? an i think that it's an she didn't actually put her schedule on here okay. but i i think that it's like an eight to five maybe even an eight to four it was okay. a daytime job i'm 99 percent sure right and and so you know she does have some options there obviously you wouldn't want to do it in the lunch hour like she wrote in um in that email like i don't want to have to teach a group class in my lunch hour i think that um that evening time groups will work with certain ages you know i i have a six-year-old who comes in for a seven o'clock lesson i was kind of concerned about that when they first signed on but he's six but he is wide awake at seven o'clock so it totally works um Wow. <laughs> well, you know, he's more awake than me at that point. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, but I think that evening group lessons are fabulous for teens because I tell you what, when I do my group lessons and I do anything earlier than 10 o'clock in the morning and even 10, they're walking in and they're like half eyes open, and <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, um, so I do think that would work. Another option would be um, maybe to do like one weekend day, like maybe do one Saturday I just lost an earbud there. <laughs> One Saturday um, where you do like a, a longer camp, um, you know, doing like a four or five hour camp and you do a lot of activities and it would be really fun. Um, and that's that's another way to do it as well because the way I do my camps are normally five days a week for two hours. So I'm looking at 10 hours total. Um, but you can cut that in half. Do, um, you know, do a four or five hour camp and do that on a weekend. Um, try to pick a, you know, survey your studio and see if they're going to be available. And and then, you know, it wouldn't be as expensive of a camp, but it also wouldn't be as difficult to pull off because you're doing it all at once. And kind of um, another idea, too, might be where, um, like Candace was doing, where she has, I mean, obviously, Christina is teaching some private lessons. So she's got those kids scheduled whenever, maybe taking one week and saying, hey, okay, this week, we're not going to do the private lessons. Let's put everyone together and we're going to have a group lesson this week. So that exactly. might be another option. Yeah. yeah. And I guess she's going to have to try a couple things and see what works for her and her family. So I'm going to pull something up here. I think that's all of our questions for right now, isn't it? That's yes. That's that's what we had. That that's what we had. And I, time you for. know, I just have to say, I, I get questions from teachers all the time. I've had um, probably like ten people reach out to me via Facebook or via email, and they're asking questions about groups. And I'm always happy to chat with you. Um, and and I think you know this group lessons 101 is just a, it's an experience, and I think people are really going to like it because. Not only are you getting interviews from people, but you're getting a lot of resources. Um, you're getting uh, like editable PDFs. You're getting forms that you can use uh, for your camps. Um, you're getting, you know, coupons to all kinds of fun things. I can't wait to use my Hogwarts coupon camp. I can't wait. Um, and you're also getting access to our Facebook forum. And our Facebook uh, group is 
fabulous. Um, we support each other so much. And I've become like good friends with a lot of these people. And it's just, it's really exciting. And Tracy, I know you keep, um, you keep pushing us along with our monthly challenges. And I, I know, absolutely oh, love gosh. it. It's March. I don't think I did that. This is well, you can put that on your to-do list. <laughs> That's right. It's been really busy, people. Yeah. Uh, it's just March 2nd, so I can do that. I like monthly challenges. I like having a goal and having, you know, just setting those challenges and encouraging one another. I just want to encourage us all because I think we have, uh, so many teachers have such good ideas and we can all learn from one another. And that was kind of why I started the, the webinars in the first place. I want us to all learn from one another. Um, so anyway, but I'm so thankful that everyone has joined us today. And I do hope that you um, that you will uh, consider buying the Group Lessons 101. I will tell you, though, there are a couple of coupons going around. And we do not want you to just use the random coupon that you see out there. There's one out there, but it's only for $5 off. And anyone who watched the webinar, we wanted you to have a bigger coupon for nearly three times that amount. So Sarah, why don't you pull that up so that everyone can write down that code? Oh, wait. That's my job. I have I to. I think, am I, have, did, I, did the screen share come from? Yeah, it did. Okay, there we it go. Did. And we're going to have um, the, the webinar. Here's the deal. The official launch is on the 7th is on Monday, but we are going to go ahead and we're going to have sort of a little pre-sale going on March 3rd through the 6th, but you want to use that coupon code and that will be at checkout when you use it. You'll see there's a little red, um, some red text that says redeem coupon and that's when you'll put it off and that'll give you 20% off. And I'll tell you a little secret. This is actually going to be live later on tonight. I'll go ahead and have it up if you want to go ahead and, um, and, and make your purchase. And remember too, you want to, when you go to our website, if you look at the bottom of the page, you can see all the extras that are included. Because I know Sarah talked about some of those, the coupon for the Hogwarts camp, so we can all be the coolest <laughs> teachers ever. <laughs> but Sarah didn't say that she's actually including the PDF for her music blast camp. We saw pictures of that. She's including that step-by-step -step plans for every single day, and that's going to be included free with your purchase. So you will be 100% ready to go for whatever camp you want to do. Um, there are also some songs from um, Daniel McFarland from Supersonics. He's given a couple songs. And actually, Sarah, I don't think I told you, but one one of them is from his new release group and it's not even been released to the public Ooh, yet. I know, exciting. It's called, yeah, I think that one's called Ice Crystals. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of a sneak peek at uh, that. My students, my students love his pieces. They're wonderful. Seriously. And I'm, I'm so happy that we were able to do this pre-sale um, because we have almost everything done. Um, we just have one more interview that, that had to get rescheduled. So that's why we're not launching until Monday. Um, but we almost have every single thing up there. Um, on Monday, we're going to add uh, another interview and we're going to add the Music Blast Camp. Um, but we wanted all these teachers who have been sending us questions and Facebooking us and emailing us, we wanted you to have access as soon as possible. And that's why we're doing this pre-sale. You're going to get 20% off from the 3rd through the 6th. And I'm going to email you this code um, and I will have a screenshot to show you exactly where you use it. Yes, so it'll be easy. It'll be easy to use, and um, and yeah, we did. We just, you know, it's it's. I'll take the camera off there. Okay, so yeah, it's it's not. We are what like probably ninety nine percent ready. I think yes. that website to go. <laughs> But yeah. why not give everyone access? That's what exactly. it's all about, right? Exactly. It is. So, um, okay, well, did we cover just about everything we wanted to cover, Sarah? I think we did, and I, I'm just so excited. I really hope to see a lot of the teachers who have joined us here today. I hope that we will eventually see you in our Upbeat Piano Teacher uh, Facebook group, um, and I look forward to hearing from you in the future. You know, we're all about motivating and inspiring one another, and I think we've got a really great thing going. Thank you so much for doing this, Tracy. It's just amazing. Amazing. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. I am just thrilled that we did this. I cannot wait until our next project. Hint, hint. Ah. hint, hint, hint. <laughs> okay. All right. Fabulous. And a special thank you to all the teachers that joined us live and you hung on until the end. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we will see you around on our Facebook group soon. All right. You guys have a great afternoon and a great week. Bye. Bye.